Good morning. Good morning. I can't think of a better way to start off Sunday morning than listen to the bell choir. We want to welcome everyone to AUMC this morning. It's good to have everybody here. I'm Scott Lehman, the late leader. And uh, just a few announcements this morning. That uh, Just to repeat from last week, that next Sunday, after the 9 o'clock service in the library, uh, Bill and uh, Barbara will be uh, receiving questions and talking a little bit about giving to the church and how you can financially uh, better the church and uh, leave them in your will and that type of thing. And then, this is a real winner. Uh, Otter's already asked if she could leave me for this. Uh, parents' Night Out, Friday, February 9th from 5.30 to 8.00. Pastor Tim's group is going to uh, babysit. <laughs> and am I welcome? To help with the kids, yes. <laughs> oh, no, I have one of the kids. So uh, from 5 to you you're not disruptive. Oh, uh, I would never be disruptive. <laughs> no guarantees. No guarantees. And then a few blocks of pair of glasses. Uh, looks like we've accumulated quite a collection. And they're outside of Dev's office. So if you're missing a pair of glasses, look there. Pastor Tim and I went and visited Joyce Gubstein on, I think it was Thursday? Wednesday. Wednesday. And uh, after visiting with Joyce, Joyce has always been an uh, idol to me in some way. Uh, she has done so much for this community, and uh, Joyce just put the word grace into my mind. And then after I read my devotions this morning, three of them talked about grace. And uh, in Christian terms, grace is defined as God's favor toward the unworthy or God's benevolence on the undeserving. In, God's, in His grace, God is willing to forgive us and bless us even though we fall short of living righteously. And I think we all do that. But it's good to know that God has given us grace, whether we deserve it or not. So let's pray and get things started this morning. And uh, we have a good, good service with Pastor Caleb getting ready to go here. Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, you got us all safely here this morning. It's kind of an unexpected snow. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege and the honor to praise you. Most, uh, some countries don't. Uh, Lord, you just bless each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you bestow on each of us. Lord, we just pray for all of our congregation that are away, that are ill, that uh, can't make it for, more, for one reason or another, but thank God that uh, we have YouTube and, and folks are able to watch the service on, on uh, their TV or their uh, iPad or iPhone. Lord, we just pray for Pastor Caleb as he speaks your word that you put on his heart this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And would you please stand for our opening? Hymn?
another. Tell somebody you're glad to see him today. Especially 
uh, for uh, for Beth. Then Becky and Henry gave this uh, request. Uh, Sarah asked uh, for prayers. Uh, still no job, and she fell and hit her head on the concrete on Friday. So we need to pray uh, for her. Uh, then uh, we want to remember Joyce Eatonstein, of course. Also, um, Chandler. I, I forget Chandler's last name. Wilson. Chandler Wilson. He, he runs uh, Alice Automotive. Uh, he's best friends with my son and my Jake. Uh, he is actually having surgery at IU Medical Center on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, and uh, it's a, a surgery that is going to knock him out of work for about a, a month at least uh, for his recovery. And uh, let's just be praying for Chandler and Allison and the girls, uh, and especially lifting them up. Uh, we want to pray for Cahoots, that's the Beyond the Walls ministry, and they're getting ready to have a new manager. <laughs> Caleb is going to be the manager at Cahoots. Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, then, uh, and actually, Caleb, you've been here about a year now. Does that seem possible? Yeah. Well, we're thankful that you're here. Aren't you thankful that Caleb's here? Pantry. Uh, we also want to continue to pray for Deb Van Dyne. Uh, Deb is our secretary. She's still recovering from her partial knee replacement surgery. Uh, she's doing better, but we just need to lift her up. Uh, we want to pray for Pastor JL and Pam and the Flint United Methodist Church. And then uh, Chapel of the Lakes, their longtime pastor, Tom Smith, retired uh, at Dece in, in December. He'd been there for almost 30 years 37 years time flies when you're having fun right uh, and uh, and so they have an interim pastor Chris Schaefer who was at uh, the Pleasant uh, Lake Community Church it is their interim right now and we just want to pray uh, that they find the right full-time pastor are there any other praises or requests that you'd like to lift up? Yes. I just want to praise that we have this many people in church today. Yeah. Like with the snow and everything, and they just right. lift up one's heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're thankful for each one that's here. Yes. I have a praise too. Um, if there's been lots of generations before my generation that I felt I'd like to give praise to God for because. I didn't get here without them mm. to know God and to continue on knowing God. You know, that's something that we forget to do sometimes. I, I'm convinced that part of what has happened in my family is that God has answered prayers uh, and it continues to answer prayers for me, from like my great grandma who was a prayer warrior. And, uh, and, you know, God it may not be through with one of your prayers for uh, 30, 40, uh, even 100 years. Anybody else? Let's uh, go ahead and sing the prayer song.
God, you are with us. And Lord, we would confess that it is true what we sang in that prayer song. Lord, we do need you. We need your guidance. We need your healing. Uh, we need your forgiveness. Uh, we need your protection. Lord, we need your provision. God, we would confess that without you, we, we can't do anything of eternal value or significance. But Lord, we are so thankful that you choose uh, to partner with folks like us to see your kingdom work done. That, that you delight in us trusting you. You delight in us uh, stepping out in faith with you. And Lord, that you want us to be encouraged today. You want us to take heart. And Lord, we, we just give you praise for that. I, I pray that you would be with uh, those who are discouraged today, uh, those who are facing trials, those who are uh, facing temptation. God, I pray that you would just minister to them today. May they be encouraged in your precious name. And brothers and sisters, you've heard the prayer requests that have been given. Would you just in your hearts pray for uh, two or three of these requests that resonated with you.
Please clarify the vision of our mission to represent you in service, that you may be known and glorified. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. with the 
fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. <clears throat> Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Like, I thought you were done. Like, 
five times. <laughs> um, so I outline when I'm preaching, when I'm speaking, I, I have a general subject and I've spent time thinking and thinking and thinking about it uh, for this week and weeks previous. But I don't have a word by word. I think that's obvious. But I, I often, when I'm speaking, praying about what to go into next. Because there's about 15 ways to go this morning, and I'd like to take the right one. And so when I pause, it's not for effect. It's to go where next. I think it's important to look at Scripture as a whole and to be able to, to gain that context for yourself. So that you know that Lazarus just died and that Jesus let him die. The other thing that really stands out between these two chapters is that when Jesus goes and raises him from the dead, um, it has an effect on the entire community. So he has loads of people are coming out, which is what you see at the end, is the verse 12. Like tons of people are coming to see Lazarus because they knew he died and they wanted to see him alive. <coughs> and so the, the act itself of, of having him resurrected it, it, it disturbs people. They want to see. They want to know. They're coming into town to see him. Um, but the other effect that it had was it, it really disturbed the religious officials who this was the last straw for them. Now, I never saw that with clarity before this week. But before this, Jesus was uh, a pest and an annoyance. And this is it. They cannot let him go on anymore. This was the final straw. So it both drew people to him and led to Jesus' triumph. How do they say that? Triumphal entry. Palm Sunday. We wave the branches and hit our friends with them. <laughs> that never happens if Lazarus isn't resurrected. His fame spread far and wide at this particular moment because of Lazarus. So all these people are coming to, to contribute, to, to cry out to Jesus that he is the Christ. They're lining up in the streets. That group of people is drawn because of the resurrection. Uh, the other group of people that is drawn because of, of the resurrection are the people who want to kill Jesus. And until now, it was okay, and we're going to see what happens, and then all of a sudden it's not okay. And it's time for him to go. Both sets of people are set into motion by what happens in John 11. The reason I'm telling you this is that if Jesus hadn't submitted to what God wanted him to do and had just done what he could have done, which is just go to his friend and heal him before he has to die, which feels like it's in his wheelhouse, you think he could have done that? Even Lazarus' sisters are like, man, you could have been here. And you weren't. We gave you enough time to get here and you didn't come. Perplexed. There's misunderstanding there. Mismet expectations. Uh, most Christians that I meet that are disappointed is because God's timing wasn't their timing. They're frustrated that they didn't get what they thought they should have gotten when they thought they should have gotten it. Have you been there? But what happens because it wasn't their timing, but it was God's timing. It's that all these things go into motion, and it's the exact right time for Jesus to go to Jerusalem and to be crucified and to die himself. And it was through Jesus' surrender in this that he was able 
to stir the pot the way that he was supposed to. It was through his submission to let his friend die that he got to go into Jerusalem the way that he was supposed to go in, which is with some people cheering and others getting ready for an assassination. into the subject this morning. Because the, the subject that we're supposed to be covering is about showing people, telling people what God has done in your life. And I think unless we are willing to submit our day-to-day -day life, there's going to be very little to talk about. Unless you're willing to talk about the times where you didn't get what you thought you were going to get. And instead, you let God do, be God and give you what He wants to give you. Testimony isn't about us. It's about what God has done. It's about what God has said. It's about His faithfulness. It's about Him being trustworthy and true even when we didn't understand. And we so often don't. And the more that we can, as a body, pray like we don't know exactly what the right thing is, pray with open hands, instead of saying, God, would you please? Saying, God, would you be glorified in this situation? Is a better prayer. Everybody who gets sick wants healed right away. And yet there are so many testimonies that come out of God's showing up in the midst of illness, in the midst of death, in the midst of tragedy. I can tell you're excited about it. <laughs> Part of us being able to tell people about God is being in submission to Him. If we're not in submission to him, we, we will miss what he is doing while we are trying to do what we want. While we are trying to manipulate our own circumstances. While we are trying to create an open door. Instead of waiting for him to open the door. Does all that make sense? Do you trust God to overcome the circumstances in your life or not to? Is God still God either way? Whether He fixes every problem or whether He says, I'll just, I'll be with you in it. Bless you. Are you with me? Are you awake? Do you remember what praise is? Come on. Do you remember? Praise is attaching value to the valuable one. It's grabbing a hold of things that would seem ordinary, but their God at work is recognizing that this is God at work and attaching that value to them. That's what praise is. Uh, if, if we're in a mindset to look for the things that God is doing, that God has done, then you can see it all the time. Um, my, my kids had the flu this week pretty much all week. They just traded off. 
one gets over it and, you know, it's time to share. Um, then I don't know why, under stress and duress, I like rise to the, like I don't go away from it. I am better than my normal self under tremendous circumstances. And so I generally do a lot of taking care of them in the midst of um, vomit. So, <laughs> uh, sitting up with them during the night and then going to work in the morning, you would think, man, that is crazy that this is happening. And you uh, very easily could be like, God, why? Um, I don't want to think that way. I would rather do something else. I mean, it's very easy to complain about your life, if you want to. Uh, some of us have made a practice of it, and we're extremely proficient. <laughs> um, there is not a single verse in the Bible that says complain about your circumstances. Not a single one. And so we've honed a skill that it, it, it has no eternal value whatsoever. And um, no earthly value either, if you want to know the truth of it. It doesn't help you, right? It, complaining about the flat tire does not make it better. The tire's still flat either way. And so what we, we have the opportunity to do that um, I'm going to use this week as an example. I am so grateful to have, have kids that have an immune system so the body is working it out. It's not going quite as quick as I was hoping. <laughs> um, but there, when you're healthy, when you get sick, your body fixes it. Which I think is like a huge amount of miracles in a row. If your car did that, you would like it a lot better, wouldn't you? <laughs> it's the radiator, but I'm going to wait, and it'll heal itself. It's not. It's not going to do that. There's actually very few things other than organic life that does, that does that. And so we get to see God at work, His design, as they work it out. And some of them get crazy temperatures and see visions. Uh, my, my kids, when they're sick, have a tendency to get very high fevers because their body's burning it out, and they say the craziest things you've ever heard while they do that. But in the midst of it, you get to see their body is working the way that God designed it, and they are not going to be sick in a few days. Well, that's amazing. It's a huge blessing. And that I get to sit with kids that are generally running around like the house is on fire. And I get to sit with them and hold them like I don't get to other times. Because they're very busy. They got a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff to do. And they just sit in my arms. And so to take these moments that are like inconvenient, but so cherishable. And when you start talking about your circumstances like that to other people, they do not know what to do. I grew, I grew up in churches that talked about, like, give your testimony. Um, we talked about, I don't even know that people say witness anymore. That was a thing in the 90s, uh, to witness to people. And what we meant was to tell other people about God. And you, you can. There are some people particularly gifted to tell strangers about God. They're extremely uh, evangelistic in the way that they are. Um, most people, i found, are not that. But they do have the potential to grab a hold of circumstances, to see God as God in their circumstances, and to live in such a way that you get to share the way that God is, is moving in your life. 
And you get to live in peace when there so often would be turmoil. And that in and of itself is a testimony to who God is in your life. It's not a testimony of the one thing that God did the one time. This isn't just about, I was forgiven back then, and now I'm the same as you. Forgiven, but live the same. You know what I mean? Forgiven, but just as worried as you are. Forgiven, but just as afraid as you are. That will never do. That will never do. How are we to say that we believe that God is God, that He is in control of all these things, that He's going to see us through, that He's faithful, that He's trustworthy? Obviously, we're very afraid. They don't mix. The two messages don't mix, so it's one or the other. And which one is it? Have you decided? And are you ready for a change? Election years are normally not so good for um, for our people. I mean, our, our Christian brothers and sisters. Just see here to flip our lids and tell people how bad it's going to be if the other guy gets in. Is that your testimony? Because if you live that way, it is your testimony. If you want to tell people about being saved, it has to be a lifestyle. It can't be a moment. It has to be a lifestyle where we're secure. Where we're cherished. Where we really do trust. And when you live in that place of security, of hope, that, that testifies to people. That preaches to people. The other thing that's really cool about that is it, as you live in a place of peace and um, you, you aren't thinking so much about your own circumstances and you get to talk to other people differently. You get to talk to people intentionally. Ask them what's going on with them. If you feel like your house is on fire, you're never asking somebody else how their house is. You will continually tell them about your house that's on fire. Yes? You're not going to meet somebody on the street and go, how's your house done? You're going to go, my house is on fire. And so if your circumstances are a house on fire constantly, I promise you're not talking about anybody else. And you're not open to talking to anybody else about their stuff. But if you're in a place of security, in a place of peace, which is not based on circumstances, it's based on your belief. It's not based on whether all your kids are well at home or not. It's based on who you believe in. And whether you trust them to take care of you. Not that everything goes perfectly, but that he is perfect. Then, then you can have conversations about other people's lives. I have a couple one-offs. Do you want those before we go? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Calm down, everybody. Enthusiasm is freaking me out. <laughs> If you're going to talk to somebody, 
about your belief. Um, you have to love them to talk to them about that. And if you don't love them, you should not talk to them about it. Or anything, probably. <laughs> Love is the precursor to sharing anything. Because sharing your faith is sharing your life. And you can't share your life with your enemy unless you love them. They will not be interested in the way that we share with people that we already think are wrong. It doesn't come off very well. So love is a precursor to sharing. Uh, often, often, hear me say often, not always. Often, you have to set aside being right to love. If you base your actions and your conversations on who's right and who's wrong, you are already in a bad place in that conversation. Think about one conversation you've had with your spouse where you knew you were right when you started that conversation. How did it go? Were they receptive? Were you passionate? You can do that with your siblings too. Where you know you're right and you know they're wrong. You're not making headway there. It's not an exchange of ideas happening. Right? Put aside who is right and who is wrong. And be open to share your life and to receive theirs. Who are the best people to give advice to? best people to give advice to? Ones who are willing to receive. <coughs> Ones who are willing to receive. Those who ask. Those who ask are generally listening. And if you can wait them out until they ask what you think, they will actually listen to what you have to say. But if you tell them what you think, before they're asking, how well does that work? It's not, it's not so good, but it's not that complicated either. And, and the circumstances that arise where people ask you for advice are generally when they know you love them and they know you're rooting for them. So if you're not in that place yet and you're not willing to get to that place, put your advice on the counter. Leave it at home. Because even if you are right, nobody's listening. And when you give good advice to people who are being foolish, and you realize that they're being foolish and they're not going to listen, you get upset. Because you know you're right. But that doesn't like make the relationship better. Or let you live in peace. Yeah? Part of the reason why I thought that these verses, this, these chapters were so interesting is that Jesus didn't go out and go, okay, we got this great miracle coming up. Everybody come over here. Like, he went there, did the stuff, and people came. People came to him. And so when we talk about sharing our faith, live your life in such a way that someone would want to come to you and go, what are you doing? How are you doing this? What is different?
Your life is the testimony. Your life is the message. And so if you don't like the message yet, change it. Be intentional to surrender your life and let God be God. To live in a place of peace where your circumstances don't run you. When you live in peace, when you live uh, in submission, people will come to you and ask you. And I'm telling you this is true. When you love them and you live in this way, there is no stopping them from asking you what is going on and why you are the way you are. And I don't encourage you to ask the other managers that work with me, but I'm telling you, I have had conversations around faith with so many people that I work with in an environment that does not encourage such things. But the more circumstances arise, the more they see the peace and they go, what's going on? Why are you okay? Why do you have joy? Why are you so patient? They will come to you. You don't have to knock on everybody's door. They'll come to you. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your faithfulness. For your gentleness with us. And I pray that we would be in submission to what you want to do when you want to do it. And we would be patient for you. And that even in the midst of circumstances that we would be at peace. Because you are God and we're not. And you handle everything in the right way, in the right time. God, I thank you that you hear us when we pray and that you have the wisdom to overlook the times where we're trying to strong-arm you into doing what we want. God, we want what you want. May we be people submitted to you, faithful to you, and willing to share your faithfulness through our lives, through our actions, and through our words. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing a part of them with us this morning?
I would encourage you to take time to practice being thankful. To practice seeing what God has done and giving Him the credit. In the same way that we have practiced worry and complaint, that we would practice thanksgiving and praise. Because without that, we will not live in peace. May we live your life in such a way that it is a testimony for God's glory. Bless you, in Jesus' name. Have a good day.